so we have the possibility to talk after the screening, uh, but a uh, few words before. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Um, thank you to, to Panorama and to Internazionale, which I'm, I'm amazed with as a cinema. Uh, I will be here after to discuss with you, answer questions. Um, I'm not uh, about to reveal anything regarding the film, just maybe perhaps to tell you that the protagonist has uh, passed away uh, shortly after we finished filming and that it's uh, in, in many ways a very strong experience for me to see her again on screen like that. So I hope you enjoy it and um, i see you after. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this feast of a film to Berlin. It's really wonderful to see it on the big screen. Um, you've been in Berlin Berlinale before, two years ago, with your first film, Exotica, Erotica, etc., in a forum. Now you're here in Panorama with Obscuro Barocco. Um, can you tell us a little bit how you met your protagonist, uh, Luana Muniz, and uh, how you collaborated with her, how that came to life? Um, the, the project started initially as, a, as an artwork, um, a work I wanted to dedicate to the city of Rio de Janeiro because it was the place where I started filming. I, I, my connection to, to cinema is, is really close to Rio de Janeiro for me. And uh, when I had finished the first film, there were still so many things I wanted to explore about the Brazilian culture that brought me back to my own Greekness, I, I will explain later about it, that uh, as soon as I had the chance, I, before moving on to more fiction projects, I decided to do a, a work about Rio de Janeiro during the year of the Olympic Games, actually. And um, this work was, um, of course, dedicated not only to the city, but to its inhabitants. And uh, what I felt that was more relevant about it, that moved me, what I would see everywhere, was a concept of transformation. So I started exploring different um, manifestations, I don't know what to say, of that. And uh, in the heart of it were the bodies in transformation, because in Brazil, those who know it realize it's a very pansexual, a very uh, promiscuous, I would say, place where you f your body thinks. So, working on the body was a, a priority and working on the transformed body that had uh, done this performance, this lifetime performance, was uh, what I wanted to do. And Juana, at the time, she's not, as I said, she's not uh, alive anymore and uh, at the time she was very active, very political, very speaking out about rights, about the condition of... of uh, transvestites mostly, but she was a voice in the LGBT community, very respected, and in, uh, in the night. So I wanted to film transvestites at night, so I had to go and take a, a permission, like, sort of. And when we met, the connection was instant. She was always uh, avid, uh, avid um, eager to, to, to do new things, new stuff. She was uh, already an actress of documentaries and even in fiction. And uh, she looked at me and she said she proposed to do something together. I, was, uh, I had not gone there to ask as much. I just wanted her permission. And I ended up uh, starting something with her. And that's how it started. But it went on to film during the last year of her life, which was very unexpected for both of us, finally. And uh, so you could say Luana was the one that led you also into the queer underground, the trend scene of uh, Rio de Janeiro, because we go into these spaces also of self-determination, of <laughs> celebratory, of celebrating the otherness and also the physical transformation and uh, the body itself. Luana made me realize things that uh, would not have been so clear for me as an outsider, even if I was speaking the language and I have lived there. First of all, I must say, as Greek, what uh, attracts me very much in the Brazilian culture because there is many levels of otherness in this project. Starting from the, from the basic one is that I'm Greek and I speak about another culture, speak, or at least I observe, I seize uh, 
another culture. And I see in that reflection things that are mine and things that are something else, which is very relevant for me. And that relevant thing for me is the Dionysiac element of the Brazilian culture, this um, trance, the total trance in every um, way of celebrating life, uh, sexual and uh, social and uh, the, the festive, uh, the parties, the carnival and all that. So that culture had many elements that I would find like uh, grains in my own culture that were intriguing for me because I come from an ancient, let's say, more um, world and uh, I saw a world that had the age of the earth there, linked to the Indian culture as well, linked to things that were going beyond to what could be young or old. So that was one thing I wanted to explore. And then this uh, discussion started also yesterday about Baroque. Uh, I would relate to the Brazilian culture through that as a European, and I had constant questions, questions about colonialism in my mind. So the Baroque paisage and the Baroque bodies and the excessive situations I would observe in Brazil were asking for, for a character, for a figure to be in the center, for a figure that would be torn like in two parts, like um, heart and body, something that would be in a, in a clash, let's say, with its nature. And I found that in Luana. The fact that she was conscious of her condition, that she asked for it and that she was demanding respect and that she was trying to make things better, this is what opened my eyes to something different. Because I had my backpack that I explained and then I go there to, 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 to explore this relation uh, of circulation of uh, cultural uh, images and thoughts and styles. And then I see a generation that has is the fruit of this mix of ancient colons and of slaves and of Indians. And I see it crystallized in a body that is like a, a stone, a, a body that is transformed and it makes a statement without even speaking. So it's true that it's very much linked to Luana and through her I managed to see and understand things happening. I managed to understand the why of this activism very powerful in Brazil. Um, because what we see in the film is not only Luana. Luana had a mansion in uh, a very central place in, uh, in Rio de Janeiro, in Lapa. And she would, um, I can hear, I don't know, uh, she would uh, accept there uh, transvestites to live. But there are also many other poles in Rio that are one of the places we see Preparanem with uh, very powerful, very active dancing and trying to make transvestites go to the university. So it's like it's a, a land of constant um, questionment about these issues. And that moment is also an interesting culture and society now, a protest, of course, there's a big protest culture, it's very imminent to society as well, which you also portray in your film. It's also sort of a seamless transformation You're from nature into the city, the topos, and to trans community, but also to political protest, that it's very, yes. very uh, urgent at the moment there. This is something I could not um, ignore, because we were at uh, the year of Olympic Games. Brazil had uh, started to on, on a downfall, which kept on. And while I was filming Transformed Bodies, while I was speaking about all these things, or filming Carnival, or other type of struggles, I was confronted to protests in the city about the changement of politics that occurred that year, which was the destitution of Dilma, uh, so-called Putsch, a changement of political situation which was very brutal. And um, I realized that all these situations, just all of them ask for the same thing, not a, an anthropological fatum, not a discrimination, just very plain, simple, democratic, desire for a change or having the right to be what you want or asking for it. So people that get dressed in the carnival that are poor come from the favelas and that they want for these nights to be the kings of carnival, they can make it. This is what they are wanting. This, this is their rights. 
a bodies of transformation of the queer community that they ask for rights is the same thing and people like everyone in a society asking for a political change for something that is not asking for justice we all want the same thing so i felt there were echoes in all these uh, three or more um, uh, milieu i would film and i added them together in the film trying to make sense at least communicate the sense I was seeing at that time. Do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, if so, please raise your hands, make yourself visible. Yes, please. Do we have mics, actually? Yes, here's a microphone. Mm. Thank you for a very, very beautiful experience. Um, my question has to do with uh, spirituality. There's a lot of concentration on the physical and the body. But um, a lot of what she says has to do with, you know, heaven, earth, purgatory. And at the very beginning, you showed the uh, Condomble ritual. It's in Banda ritual, actually, this one. It's Preto Velio, which is, there's a slight difference, but yes, it's in the family of uh, syncretism. I will speak about that. Uh, what is the name? The, the Banda. Con okay. Yeah, so that, that's my question. If you can talk about that, is that part of the aim, or did it become part of the journey as you were brought inside? Uh, it's a very interesting question because I usually don't speak about it. The film starts with that, about, with the transformation. And it's another uh, crystallization of this mix or devouring of cultures. The, the religious syncretism in Brazil is something very alive. I don't know if you are from there or if you know it. But uh, I was uh, impressed by the fact of it's a very spiritual country. Uh, Catholicism is, uh, is not something to be, we can talk about for, for longer. Uh, but at the same time, you have these other religions coming from Africa, still um, persist, practiced, and very much. And I wanted very much to start the film with a ritual I had uh, assisted, which is a preto velho. And preto velho, it means uh, the old uh, black person, it's referring to a slave, uh, slaves that would come from uh, Africa, mostly in Bahia, that uh, were smoking a pipe and through the smoke would heal or would uh, clean. And the person that conducts it, that does it, is uh, an ancient maid. So there are always these social uh, things about, at least for me, who knows. And she incorporates, she brings the spirit of the Preto Velio so that it gives to Luana a sort of blessing and the film starts. The spiritual part of the film is very much linked with the text of Clarice Lispector that I chose to use. Um, and uh, it's, that's what I said before, it's always uh, a double situation of body and the soul. It's, it's a film about doubles, I have the feeling, as I was speaking about Europe and Brazil, about um, bodies transformed, about the feminine and the masculine. So for me, there, there is a lot of spirituality in the film, but uh, the, the tip of the iceberg is the body, and the way the body over there becomes spiritual, because you go through this by senses, through senses. You believe through your body there. And uh, the importance I give to it is that I start to feel it. It persists, that it changes, it responds. Do we have any further questions from the audience? Please raise your hand. You will be on, yes, in the back there. <laughs> Hello. Uh, posso falar em português? Ou é o estado de Deutsch? Deutsch ou de português? Como assim? Posso falar em português? Você pode, mas eu acho que as pessoas não vão entender, mas depois eu vou fazer uma tradução. Tudo bem. <laughs> ok, eu quero agradecer o filme belíssimo. Adorei. Você sintetizou a questão religiosa, espiritual, física, é, folclórica, a nossa cultura, e de uma forma muito poética. E incluindo textos da Clarice Lispector, e, assim, incrível, parabéns pelo projeto. Eu, era isso que eu queria agradecer, pelo lindo filme. Obrigada. Obrigada a você. I just... Uh,
as a body itself. I'm not familiar with your other work, but do you think that you could transfer this view to any other city and maybe make a couple of more projects in the future where you realize your view of the city as a body to other ci cities on maybe different continents? Or was this just because you have such a special relationship with Rio de Janeiro? Uh, no, uh, no and yes. Uh, I will, I will keep on the topos, as we say in Greek, is very important for my uh, cinematographic desires and uh, in, at least on my documentary uh, practice, it always starts with uh, could the food on, with the place. So it was the case with Brazil, but my first film was uh, an apartheid film, let's say, because it was shot on boats. So it was a very nice way to start filming in the world. And in Brazil it was a tribute, because I had to. And that permitted me to pose a different uh, look, I don't know, gaze, or, on my uh, hometown, on Athens, which has been... Uh, my own profound uh, clash for years and uh, it's the first time I want to film it, it's the first time I, after having looked long, uh, for a long time something else, now I want to look the place where I come from. So yes, there are new projects that are linked to new places, um, one of which is Athens, another one is Egypt. And, uh, and eventually Lebanon. It's all our places where I've started doing things. So we'll see what will come up. Definitely linked with the anthropal geography, not only just the place. But uh, uh, yes, it's something I can imagine doing elsewhere, that's for sure. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any further questions? Otherwise, I'll ask the last. Oh, there's one. Oh, yeah. Hello. I would love if you could explain more the relation with the Clarice Lispector text, how it worked uh, together with uh, the main character, and why you had this decision to use this text. Okay, uh, the Clarice Lispector text, uh, which is called Agua Viva, uh, is the stream of life in English was um, a choice that came while I was editing. I had done some documentary experiences in Brazil for a couple of months for my art project, and I ended up with uh, islands of um, footage, as I call them, through which I wanted to navigate with something. But Luana was already there. She was saying uh, many things, but not as abstract as I would have wanted. And uh, while you edit, you know, maybe it's not the moment that you discover new artworks, but it just happened that this book came to me. And I remember finishing it in a day or something. And it, it was so much in echo to what I was looking for. And I was trying to write at the time, maybe to start a scenario, to fabricate the film in the editing, that I immediately decided to put it in. And the first decision brought another one, which was I wanted to put it in Luana's mouth. So I had to go back to Brazil, register with her, again back to Paris, and then we registered it twice, actually. And that brought us so much together. She 
she was having the creeps reading Clarice Lispector in her own language that she had not read before, and that Clarice Lispector wrote this book as if she was a painter that had just broken up with someone. It's a book that it has, it's not about figuration, it's about abstraction. It has no beginning, no end, it's just like that. And uh, at some points, she says that uh, she gender doesn't see her or thinks that Luana would relate to in a very profound and unexpected way. So it was very instinctive, the choices we made. Sometimes it was um, formal, like when Luana had spoken better in the registration, but usually it was um, it just felt right at some point. And I, I really fought for it and I went back and back again to, to try to make it work with her. And some scenes were created, thinking of it, the blue light scene, is, uh, is definitely um, a, a, a sequel, you know, a consequence of my reading Clarice Lispector. And Clarice Lispector, uh, is, for those who don't know, is a very important Brazilian author um, that uh, has, has a use of language which is very particular, untranslatable, well, you manage, but it's not the thing. And this feeling of otherness comes again through that text. There is a sort of distance through using the words that I, I really loved. <coughs> yeah. It reflects also really the fluidity of the bodies there and, and the fluidity between the genders. And it reflects something like a, a total uh, neon. I've seen neon. A neon is the, when there is nothing, it's a sort of a vertigo of life, you know, and when you feel that uh, bodies that are transformed are in such an urgency, um, you don't, you're very careful with the words you choose to use, and I felt a little bit relieved when I first, I found a text, a Brazilian text, that would speak about that, and that would speak, not about that, about something else, but that my character would embrace it and she would say, this is what I'm living, what I'm going through. I'm, I'm making myself, I will keep on making myself until I reach the pit. And that text made me think of saying Baroque before. Um, I, w I think about that city that was made from a one soul sculptor who was called Aleja Gino in yeah. Belo Horizonte, mm. that he kept on making in the dark because he was sick and he was not working in the daylight. And he brought to the light hybrid forms. That's what Baroque is. The new Baroque, Latin American Baroque, is, is different than the European one. So I, I would find fragments of thoughts I had. The, the cathartical dance that they dance, it's called Misa Negra, the Black Mass, in Clarice Lispector's book. For me, it was like a Dionysian orgy, because in the beginning I was considering putting. Um, uh, Bacante of Euripide uh, in the t in, as a text in my film, which, which is the god Bacchus, Dionysus, that arrives from another city. And for me, Dionysus lives in Brazil. It's not if he would be around, he would be there. So, <laughs> so yeah, Clarence Inspector felt like uh, she just came and uh, gave fertilized everything I had already stored for us. It's, it's good when it happens. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, the editing process that you already spoke a little bit about it, because when we see in the beginning the relatively long shots, it starts slow and contemplative, and then the editing changes also, the rhythm and the pace, which also perfectly the, the text uh, the really yeah. um, works well along with it. Maybe you can talk a little bit the editing. It's a pity that the editor who is here is not present in this um, Q&A. So the editing it was the A and Z of the project. Otherwise we would have a, a big installation with screens and stuff, but we would not have a film. So it took a long time and it was a moments a difficult experience because I tend to film a lot and I arrive with uh, hundreds of hours and we have to look at them. And then we have to let the material impose some things. And when you don't have words on it, so if you have a project that doesn't have a script already, I had my ideas, but not for one shot, for many little shots, for many little short films, that's what I want to do. 
we just have to pay attention and listen to the images as if they have words, things to tell us. And the images you see is very organic. They, they as if they have an emant, an emant uh, magnet. Some fit with others, some go to others, some um, dictate a meaning. And it's very funny when you see nature, like shots of nature, wants to go somewhere and understand something. And you, you realize it's an organism and you must respect it. Respect it with another person that is not you, it's difficult. The other person must be completely in your shoes or even ahead to protect you, protect the project protect himself. It's, all these things are, are dark and <laughs> like you're in a cave, a humid cave, and you work. We felt like that because we were working in a, a dark, of course, place, but in the summer, in a humid place. And uh, it was very physical. So I have the feeling of experienced a long time, this film in that editing process. Uh, and until the end, we kept on swapping, moving things. Um, but we want the film to be short, like a short uh, material for longer than it was. But we wanted to tighten it, like to make it um, on a big screen, immersive and quick. Hopefully it uh, felt like that. But that was the point, to, to have, have a, an audience under this influence. And before they think what has gone, in on, what has been going on, go to a new thing, and a new thing, bombard with, uh, it was a choice, it was a conscious choice. Uh, after, my way of filming is, is slow, so it's the editing that shapes it. Mm. So talking about the immersive experience, I think we also have to talk about the sound um, yes. of the film, which the is sound. also a big part of the whole experience. Yeah, the sound. As I film alone, um, I do the sound as well. It's not uh, uh, it's something I'm proud of because I don't think I'm too much concentrated on the sound. I'm more concentrated on the image. In Brazil, I had a couple of occasions where I was accompanied for the sound, but we never had the time to do it properly where we were in the place. And the editor, my editor, sound editor, is called Jérôme Gontier, amazing work, and Yorgos Lambrinos for the image, sorry it felt natural, but I didn't say his name. He told me <laughs> the other day that if you had brought me sounds, real sounds, as a real uh, engineer would bring, I would not have created the same film, because, because I would not have used the imagination or system D, as we say, to find ways to create from fake Sound is all about that uh, in cinema, but to create from other things um, the sound and to plunge us into a weird reality. So I think that the sound, having been created mostly after, we had some directs, of course, uh, it adds another layer of that, of what is, of, of identity, sound identity, but what is real and what is not. You know, I, I, and now I'm used to that. Even in documentary, I know that we use uh, ways that go like that. You know, so, uh, at least the way I do cinema is not uh, just go there, do it and leave. It's not that type of documentary cinema. So I, I allow myself, myself to use um, techniques of fiction sometimes. This film has a lot of it in it. In, you know, and sound is uh, a proof of that. <laughs> the scenario or the text is another. Uh, Luana says your things, Clarice Inspector says other things, and Luana's mouth is a sort of entrance, as I write, uh, we have in the press kit, to another world. So it's important that these things are sort of recycled. For instance, in the end, Luana is lip syncing on a song, which that song is a remix of another song, of La Vie en Rose, Evede Piaf. So it's about the use and reuse and reuse and finding new ways, intelligent ways of being. That's why it's Baroque. And, uh, mm. and yeah, <laughs> keep on for that. Well, <laughs> well, um, well, thank you for being here. And thank you for this wonderful Q&A. Oh, thank you. If you want to...
There's another chance uh, to catch Evangelia to another, uh, together with another film team, which is on Wednesday. Wednesday. It's on Wednesday. It's a Teddy Diversity Talks. You can find it on the Teddy website, but also in the program. Um, Evangelia will speak about her film of School of Baroque, and we will have Kiko Goifman and Claudia Priscilla talking about their film, Bisha Travecci, and um, you know, the similarities, the differences, I think it's going to be a very, very nice experience. So look it up and join us there. Thank you for being here. Thank you again, Evangelia. Thank you for having me. And don't forget to vote for the audience award. Thank you very much.